Now that's significant. The Market Research Podcast. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on this latest episode of Now That's Significant, a market research podcast. This is your host, Michael Howard, the Head of Marketing at InfoTools. Today, we're joined by Emily Palladino, Group Head of Customer Insights at Country Road Group, one of Australia's largest specialty fashion retailers. Emily is a senior consumer-led marketing leader with over 20 years of experience across a range of industry sectors, including fashion, retail, FMCG, and service industries, including holding previous insights positions at Target and Buller Dairy Foods. Welcome to the show, Emily. Hello, Michael, and thank you so much. What a fantastic intro. <laughs> You're welcome. It's, your, <laughs> it's yours, not mine, so... Uh... <laughs> Um, Just giving myself a low-key compliment there, Michael. Yes, no, that's right. <laughs> um, so what's the most significant thing that you're going to share with us today? Well, I thought that what we could have a chat about today, Michael, is the softer side of managing uh, customer insights teams on the client side. So, you know, we... we um, we work with a number of different business units within the business and across the business. Um, and, and we conduct a lot of important things, but sometimes communicating the importance of the work that we do and building the reputation of that internal team can be a little bit tricky. So I'm just going to take the audience on a little bit of a journey of um, the tactics and the strategies that I use to, to build the reputation of my team. Um, and to really raise the impact and influence of my team within the business. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing some of this here. Um, and I'm, I'm sure our listeners will as well. Um, it, it's something that we think about often, how can we raise the profile of insights teams across organisations? Um, but I guess before we delve into that, could you share a little bit about your career journey and how you came to lead the customer insights team at Country Road Group? Sure. It's been uh, quite a journey. And I know that when I speak to other customer insights practitioners um, in the outside world, you know, outside of Country Road Group, they'll say that a lot of them will say that they fell into customer insights by accident. But I think mine was a little bit, my path was probably a little bit more structured than that. Um, and I think it was really led by a decision that I made when I was at university. So I was actually on the path to become a clinical psychologist and I was studying at Monash University here in Melbourne. And in my third year um, of the undergraduate degree, I actually did some voluntary work um, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. And so I found myself in a little bit of a crisis. And I spoke to a career a career counsellor at um, at the university, and he actually suggested that I apply for a master's degree. It was a new master of arts degree that was being launched uh, the next year, and um, it was going to be focused on applied social research. And he said, "Look." You've got such an amazing background with the three years that you've done in psychology and sociology. He said, I think it would just be a really lovely progression for where you're at and, you know, what, what you're interested in. And so, so I did that and that's when I was really introduced to social research and I became a little bit hooked, Michael. So um, I moved into, so I did that degree and then a few years later, I moved into marketing as well. So I, I, I did start working for a market research agency initially, and then I worked in, uh, moved into marketing. And so I had already, I guess, become used to and got the experience from a back of house perspective. So insight, strategy and planning. And then I moved into a front of house sort of um environment and that's when I got used to communications development and creative development as well and so I've, I've really oscillated between back and house and front of house over over the years um, but at the moment I work um, in back of house and have done so for a number of years so 
I work uh, in Insights and obviously manage um, the Insights team at Country Road Group. Prior to this role, I worked at an, um, a, a holding company for three, there were three Australian brands at, at that time and the company was called Propel Group. And, and then prior to that, I was at Target Australia. So I've been working in retail for quite a few years um, and I'm really enjoying this back of house uh, role where I can really focus on the things that, that, that really excite me and really getting, you know, I, I'm put, go, getting under the bonnet and really understanding, you know, what, what, what turns people on, uh, what turns them off, what motivates their behaviour um, and then getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, what we can do to, to try and influence that behaviour as well. Mm, yeah, some really interesting challenges. Um, from a motivational perspective, I guess, um, it's often the front of house, um, those that are at the, in the front that typically get all of the, the fame and the glory, don't they? But it's the back they of sure house. Do. It's the back of house that really enables that, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I've been quite fortunate, I think, in my career that I've worked in companies that really value the work that we do. Um, but gosh, you know, when you, when I, because I worked agency side for such a long time, that's what, what I forgot to mention. I actually worked agency side for years and years before I got into client side roles. So I only moved client side about probably about 12 years ago, but prior to that, and the bulk of my career was actually agency side. And sometimes we'd work with clients who, you know, who was, you could tell were just on struggle street. You know, they were trying so hard to influence their internal stakeholders as well. And um, as you say, you know, um, the back of house doesn't always get um, the recognition that for the work that we do. So, I've seen it firsthand. It can be really tricky, but um, but to my point earlier, I, I guess I've been really fortunate because I've, I've I've seemed to have landed in in companies that really value what we do, which you know makes our job just a little bit easier, which is great. Mm. But you still need to foster that, though, don't you? You can't just oh, yeah. take it for granted. Absolutely, absolutely. Developing those relationships, um, building the profile of your team, and um, constantly almost pushing yourself to be involved in the decision making and those conversations that are taking place across the business is um it's a full-time job michael yes so <laughs> um when there are um, financial downturns there are often um some restructures that take place some people move on to other roles mm -hmm. And teams need to rebuild themselves. Um, so for anyone out there looking to do this or in the process of it, what are some of the most important qualities you'd look for when trying to establish a, a, a high-performing insights team? Sure. Um, I know this is probably going to sound a little bit trite because I think a lot of people would tend to say this, but finding team members that fit in culturally um, is really important because if, if they don't fit in, um, it just doesn't quite work. So that would probably be one of the most important things that I look for when I'm meeting a potential candidate um, to, to join my team. That's not saying though that all of my team members are the same um, because they're not at all. They all come from completely different professional backgrounds um, and personal backgrounds as well. They're all completely different. But I think what makes them similar is that they share similar qualities. So um, they're all really hardworking. They take pride in the work that they do. They work with integrity and they also look out for one another. Um, the the team members that are in my team at the moment are so incredibly tight, even though they are so different, um, that it's, it's it, A, it's just wonderful to watch um, as their manager, but it also just makes my job that much easier because they do look out for one another and 
they do work in a very similar way, which is fantastic. Um, and also, it, it makes me look good, which is one of the things that I say to them as well. I say, you know, your job is to, is to advance your career. Um, your other job is to do the job that you were hired to do. Um, but then when you do both of those, you make me look good, which is which is brilliant, obviously. Mm. Um, and then I guess the third thing that I look for is they need to be smart but also experienced. And it's probably, I think, the experience is something that I, I've been reflecting on lately I don't tend to trade off on. And the reason for that is because in an ideal world, I would have this really big team and I would have all of these different types of team members in them with a you know different experience levels of experience and then I'd have more junior players and more senior players and so on and so forth but in reality because we are an expense to the business we're highly valued but we're an expense we don't literally bring in the revenue um, it's it's really difficult to try and fight for bigger budgets for my cost centre. And so the headcount is really difficult to grow. And that's why I need people to be smart in my team, but I need them to be experienced because they need to be able to wear lots of hats. They need to be able to do their job and help their, their other team members as well. And they need to be able to do that as a team, but work autonomously as well. So if I hired people that were inexperienced they just wouldn't be able to do that so they're probably the three most important things for me the cultural fit um you know the, those those similarities in terms of being hard workers and and experience mm -hmm. so that point you made in terms of fighting for budgets um has got mm -hmm. to do um ultimately with return on investment um with insights and we hear this coming up a lot with uh, with my podcast, but also in the in the market as well. Just how mm. hard people find it to um, to showcase the value that they return to the business. Exactly. Um, so how do you go about that um, in your role? We don't rest on our laurels at all. We are only, and I keep saying this to my team all the time, we are only as good as the last project that we ran. We're only as good as the last presentation, the last meeting that we chaired. So we have to continue to deliver that value time and time again. Um, but just taking a few steps back from that, um, I think there's a few things that you need to consider when you are setting up a team within the business. And I think where I started, not I think, this is where I started. So when I first started the business almost three years ago, I probably took the first six months to just watch and observe. Um, and I didn't do much else, if I'm honest, because I needed to understand how the business um, runs, who are those decision makers. And sometimes those decision makers are, at the top so you know they're in c-suite but there are also decision makers that aren't in c-suite that are you know really influencing from the bottom up um so just watching and observing was really really important to me the second step that i took was really to um interrogate and i guess ascertain what the ideal scenario would look like so what 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 did my team need to look like and how did how do we need to behave and what are the sort of projects that we needed to deliver in order to not only deliver to the needs of the business but also to ensure that we could demonstrate you know what what we could really do so really you know speaking to lot, lots of um, influencers within the business really trying to understand what were those business objectives and what was the business overall trying to accomplish and then because we have five brands that sit within the portfolio of the business understanding each of those brands what were their particular 
objectives, what were they trying to deliver, was then really important as well. So um, that then enabled me to, I guess, start to map out what were those projects that we needed to deliver um, and how were we going to demonstrate that expertise as well. Um, and then what I did is I started to build those relationships because sometimes even though you manage to curate this really beautiful team that have all of those um, all of those you know, values that I that I mentioned earlier, um, that you manage to set up all of these projects that are going to be able to deliver to the needs of the business and the objectives that we were trying to um, deliver. It's important to, to have people that are on your side. So even having a few relationships where you can build these advocates, um, you will find that they will do some of that job for you. You know, good positive word of mouth does wonders. Um, and so that's what I did. I built some really good advocates from the bottom up and then from the top down. And I found that they ended up making my life a hell of a lot easier. And then, as I said, you know, um, you just have to continue to deliver that value as well. Um, you're only as good as your 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 last presentation and your last project. So you don't deliver it once. You deliver value um, every time you show up, every conversation, every meeting. Uh, so, Emily, can you share an example of a project where your team's insights have led to a significant business transformation or, or outcome? Yeah, sure. So... I think what I end up doing, and I've only been thinking about this over the past couple of days, actually, Michael, I think I've used the same tactic in every job that I've had on client side. So just bear with me. What I tend to do is I tend to design a project that ladders up into the business objectives and so it, so it does, you know, what we're supposed to do, which is great but it also allows us to showcase what, you know, our true abilities and what we're able to bring to the table. And so one of these projects that I've designed uh, in my current role, and there's, there's been more than one, to be perfectly honest with you, but this was this seminal strategic project that really put us on the map, was a market and customer segmentation project. Um, and it really became our, our gate game changer, so to speak. So it, it had taken us a while to gain traction in the business because we were brought in as a brand new team and research used to be managed by the heads of marketing of each brand across the portfolio. So when I joined and my team joined, we completely restructured the way market research was, was managed and executed. So we knew it had to be really, really good. So we launched this um, project called the Market and Customer Segmentation Project with a view, as I said, to, to ladder up into the business objectives, which was really focused on growth, growth both within our portfolio and outside of our portfolio. So we segmented and sized the market so that uh, we could see what the opportunities were outside of our portfolio. We then um, mapped our brands onto the market to see how our brands were currently positioned so that we could do a couple of things. One is we could calculate what the headroom was between what we were, we were currently doing and, and achieving versus what those opportunities were to grow the base with additional customers sitting outside of our customer base. But we also um, looked at how we could optimise the brands to grow um, from within, so increase that share of wallet as well. As a result, we identified the white space so that we could develop an acquisition strategy for the portfolio, which is fantastic. We identified the headroom for each brand um, so that we could refine the brand strategy for, for each brand. And then we repositioned three of the five brands within our portfolio. This took about 
two years from um, design and inception to, to delivery. And to be honest, even now that I'm in the third year of being um, at Country Road Group, we still reference that project. In fact, I referenced it only last week in, in an ELT meeting. So it really has um, not only, as I said, not only delivered to the needs of the business, but it's also enabled us to really showcase who we are and, you know, why we're subject matter experts and, and, and what we can bring to the table, which has been absolutely brilliant. That sounds fantastic. Thank you for sharing. No worries. Um, how about some of the challenges in your face when trying to influence senior stakeholders? How, how did you overcome them um, and then build up those relationships with those individuals that you've talked about? Yeah, so... I think I spoke earlier on about, um, you know, just sitting back and observing and um, trying to work out who those decision makers were. And what I found in my discovery stage is that there's those senior, like really senior decision makers that sit in C-suite, obviously, but then there's other decision makers as well that influence from bottom up. Um, so... That was where I actually started. Um, so I started with the heads of marketing and the heads of digital, and it was because I had had those roles before in, in previous lives that I was able to actually speak their language and so um, gained some really good advocates at that level. They actually then did some of that hard work for me because then they spoke to their managers who were in C-suite and were like, hey, you know what? this Emily chick is actually all right. She knows what she's talking about and she's she's built this really good team. And so they did a lot of that hard work for us initially, which was brilliant. Um, and then I and then I switched it and and um, and started influencing top down. So that's when I started to get to know their managers um, who are also in C-suite and and started to speak to, you know, the CEO and the CFO and start to speak their language as well. So I kind of attacked it from both from both angles, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest challenge, though, was um, just trying to prove myself initially and try and get in there and elbow my way into meetings so that I could start having those conversations. Um, finding time in everyone's you know, super busy calendars was another challenge. Trying to get past the brilliant gatekeepers that are EAs as well, like you literally have to make them your best friend um, to try and schedule in meetings. And then I think one of the consistent challenges that I've found not only over the past three years of being in my current role but also in previous roles as well wow. is just trying to find... That, that fine balance between being empathetic to their needs and their challenges and their experience um, versus, you know, also trying to push your own agenda because you also have a motive and objectives to meet and goals to deliver. Um, and you're the subject matter expert, so you also need, you know, you know the, the job that needs to be done. So trying to find that balance between the two um, is something that you know I, can, I continue to to be challenged by and and um, and work with. Mm. So one thing you mentioned before was were your direct reports and your wider team, and there's obviously a lot of what you're saying here falls on your shoulders, but you can also utilize um, some of your uh, the rest of your team to do this. They've sure. obviously got. Um, ambitions to grow and and to become the next you um to to make yourself redundant in, in one right. sense so you're you're helping to grow the next generation of insights leaders exactly. how how are you trying to or encouraging and mentoring them and getting them exposed to these kinds of challenges as well yeah you're absolutely spot on michael one of the parts of my role that i take actually the most seriously is making sure that I coach them to be the best that they can be and coach them to get the best out of them as well. 
and um, and look for those opportunities so that they can shine. So I have organised, one of the first things that I did actually was organise uh, quarterly presentations where my team gets an opportunity to actually showcase who they are, what they know um, and what they can bring to the table. So that was one of the very first thing that I did and I'm constantly looking for those opportunities. So we still deliver those quarterly presentations. Um, we, uh, I've organised sessions for them to be able to deliver to um, ELT. I've looked for opportunities for them to be able to present and deliver to the whole business as well at town halls. So, and they, they're also now involved in an internal training program where they introduce what it is that we do, customer insights, to um, to new managers within the, across the business and then from an onboarding experience as well as people join. So I've, I've, I've set them up to be those subject matter experts across the business and it's, as I say, something I take very seriously and, and something that I'm really quite relentless with. Um, so, you know, demonstrating my value is a minor part of the job, um, but making sure that I set them up to take my place is actually the most important thing that I do. Yeah, it sounds a, a fantastic uh, bit of work that you're doing and a great um, approach to your work. So uh, on behalf of your colleagues, I thank you. It's awesome oh, to hear. Thank you. <laughs> mm. um, <clears throat> how do you see the role of consumer insights evolving inside client-side organisations over the next few years? I think we're going to continue to be those strategic partners that key decision makers partner up with um, in years to come. And I don't know whether I've just been really lucky in my client side roles where I have found myself in companies that do really value what I do and what my team does um, or, or, my, or maybe it's a little bit of that and a little bit of the fact that I'm so relentless at, you know, um, making sure that we do deliver that value. But either way, um, I consider ourselves to be really, really crucial to the business. Um, we feed into all of the strategies from a business perspective and from a brand perspective, product, digital, customer, like the whole, the whole gamut. Um, and so in my view, we will only become more and more important as the years, um, as the years, years go by especially in this really, really tricky macroeconomic time that we're, we're living through at the moment. And I know being, you know, working in retail, we're, we're really feeling the brunt of it, but I don't think it's ever been more important to understand what the market looks like, who the competitors are and what they're doing, how they're behaving, how they're performing, um, who our customers are, what turns them on, what turns them off, what motivates them, and, and what's going to get them to choose us over our competitors. Like we are, we're a small team, but my God, we churn through a lot of work, right? The amount of work that we not only deliver proactively, but are asked to participate in is pretty phenomenal. And I don't mm. see that stopping anytime soon. Yeah, cool. And do you, do you see much of a... a external partnerships being a big part of that as well or do you do you see the internal team taking up a lot of that um uh, the, the firepower as it were yeah good question i would say it's both we've got some phenomenal external part uh, partners that you know they're, they're not vendors um they're not agencies they're actually partners and they're an extension of our team we've spent a lot of time getting them on board we, we continue to spend a lot of time keeping them up to date with what's happening in our business so that, so that pardon me, um, everything that they do comes from a place of knowledge uh, rather than second-guessing themselves. So having those partners is, is crucial to what we do. Um, but similarly, you know, we've, because of budgetary constraints, which, again, aren't going to let up anytime soon, we've had to bring in 
a lot of things um, in-house as well. So we built a market research online community a couple of years ago, which are nothing new. They've been around for over 20 years, but um, we uh, it, it was the first time that Country Road Group had had one and it took a long time to get off, off the ground because they the business just couldn't understand why we thought it was so important. And, and now we run so much of our bespoke research projects, like smaller, uh, more agile research projects through the community ourselves. Um, but we also run our own cost of living tracker um, that we've been running now for, for close to nine months. And we run it ourselves via the community because we've got over 8,000 of our customers in there and our customers used to, before, you know, cost of living just became ridiculous, um, used to actually behave in, in a different way to the way external consumers are be, have been behaving for some time. And so we needed to get in there and just understand why were our customers behaving a little bit differently. So, um, you know, that, that's that been another seminal project for us. Um, that's really uh, got us a lot of um, attention across the business as well. So being able to, I guess, swing between the two, having really good external suppliers, uh, suppliers, my goodness, I've used that word, <laughs> external partners um, that really understand what we do and can deliver what we need when we need it and, and then counterbalancing that with, uh, managing a lot of work in house because we have to is is um, is really important. And again, yeah. not something that I see letting up anytime soon. Absolutely. And um, having primary data, um, you can't you can't ever really get enough of that, can you? Absolutely. And um, I guess you're in a, a lucky position to have not just um, to survey. Um, tracking data but also your transactional data as well so yeah. being able to to mix uh, methods and, and data sources together um, puts you in a, in a in a good spot doesn't it yeah absolutely so I've got I've got three different streams that sit in my team I've got one one stream that focuses um, more on you know the macro um, data that that comes in that's available to us ver via various subscriptions so we're constantly keeping abreast of what's happening from a cultural insights perspective and also just from a macro level at, at all sort of levels so we know what's happening globally as well as what's happening in the Australian market we've got a second stream that um, really focuses on on research um, both the research that we conduct internally and then research that we commission our partners to do um, externally for us. Um, and then we've got an analytical um, stream as well. And that team deep dives into our databases, which are enormous, um, thanks to our fantastic loyalty programs. So we've got four loyalty programs that have been running for quite a few years um, and so we've been able to build quite significant databases through that and we've been running another one um, for one of our smaller brands for probably about 12 months and so that's been slowly building as well um, which again gives us access to those customers so that we can um, as you say not only understand what's happening at a macro level um, but then also speak to our customers to understand what their motivations are and then deep dive into that behavioural data to to close that say-do gap as well. So um, we're quite fortunate in that way. Mm. So um, <clears throat> what advice would you give insights professionals <laughs> who want to make a significant impact in their organisations? I would say um, make sure that you are aligned to those business objectives because um, you can get you can get excited about a whole bunch of projects that aren't actually going to turn um, turn the needle on anything that's really important or pertinent to the business. So make sure that what you're doing does ladder up to those business objectives. Um, deliver. Um, and I know that sounds weird, but it's really easy to 
get excited about new projects, um, get excited at the initial phases and, you know, the, the setting up phase and then not actually deliver those projects because you then get distracted by, by the new shiny thing. Um, so make sure that when you start something, you actually deliver it and and more than that, you embed it across the business because that's the only way that it will actually take, tra- you know, take effect and, and gain that traction. Um, and then another piece of advice I would say, put yourself out there and build your personal brand across the business. Um, I mean, you need to do that outside of the business as well, but do it inside of the business um, so that people even know that you exist. When you work for companies like, you know, the company that I work for, we're talking thousands of employees. So um, you don't want to be just another employee. Um, you want the decision makers to actually know you on a first name basis. And, and yes, your manager will help you do that. And that's what I do for my team. But they also need to do it for themselves. Um, and, and they become very good at PRing themselves as well across the business, which is important. Mm. Are there, so we talked about some do's. Are there any don'ts um, that you would, any watch outs just to maybe just put on ice? Mm, I would say um, don't get, try not to get bogged down in all that peripheral, you know, rubbishy, poor behaviour that can come up when people are are either scared, um, you know, because times are tough and you might get scared that your, your role's in danger and so you might start acting in a little bit of a, negative way like try not to get bogged down in the in that in that um try not to get bogged down in the politics of the place as well um and you know the gossip and the negativity it's not going to win you any favors with anyone if you get bogged down in that and and try not to be envious of other people that are doing well um it's never a coincidence or accidental if if your peers are doing well it's because they're putting a lot of work into what they're doing. So instead of being envious, um, think about what you can do um, to to get yourself noticed um, and get your personal brand out there. Mm, good advice. Um, lastly, any particular advice, uh, experiences or lessons from your career that you believe are essential for future leaders in the insights field? I would say... Um, and I mentor someone, and I keep saying this to her as well, network, network, network. Um, you can only do so much within the business that you're working in, um, number one. Uh, you can only learn so much within the business that you're in as well. So getting that outside learning from other experts outside of your business I think is really important. And also you don't know what's around the corner. Um, so getting to know other professionals uh, and insights practitioners outside of your immediate job can open up opportunities for you in the future that you would never have been able to to be exposed to if you didn't meet um, all of these people and networks. So get out there well, would, be um, my, would be my it's advice. A, it's <laughs> a really good plug for the, um, the Human Insights Conference that's coming up um, at the end of the month. Yes. Uh, I'm sure there's still some last minute tickets for anyone that uh, wants to go out there. Um, a, a colleague of mine actually is heading across the ditch to um, to attend. So, um, oh, lovely. Yeah, it's a, a, a good event to, to be at. Absolutely. You know, any, any of the insights and customer experience um, conferences that are out there, and there are a lot, um, get out there, um, meet people, network, volunteer to present at them as well. It's a it's an amazing opportunity and uh, for you to to learn and, and also showcase a little bit about who you are as well. I know that I get involved in quite a few Australian and international conferences, um, and I'm always encouraging my team to do the same thing. Mm. So just quickly on that then. 
Uh, some people think that they can't present at those because what they have to say is confidential, sensitive information. Sure. How how would you um, sort of uh, combat that or um, address that particular issue? Look, it depends on on where you work and and you know what what sort of information you're able to share. I know that in my roles, I can't. Um, obviously can't share anything about you know sales and revenue or give away any um any trade secrets as such um but you can um you can share some of those experiences as as, as long as you're not giving all that sensitive information away um and you can also you know, you, you can also share opinions. Like, that's always valid. Um, it doesn't have to be linked to your particular current role. Um, you can share your experiences in terms of, you know, how you've set up teams. It's similar to what we've done today. Um, mm. That's not giving away trade secrets. That's that's my IP, if anything. Um, so, you know, you're still able to, to share experiences. Um, and if you want to showcase particular projects, then just bring it to your corporate affairs manager and, and make sure that you're still able to, to deliver a really good presentation that others will find useful, but still do that within the constraints um, set by your business. Absolutely. Great words. So um, as I say, this as well, um, we have a um, research effectiveness awards um, in New Zealand, which is um, is currently accepting uh, nominations or uh, entries. So uh, some good advice for, for people there too. Great. So um, look, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I've really enjoyed hearing uh, your inside perspectives um, on building um, an insights team. And I hope this has been really encouraging to others in the field, those that are going through the process or those that one day might be able to lead that as well. Um, very appreciative of it. Absolute pleasure. Thanks so much, Michael. And thanks, everyone. That's right. And if you have enjoyed what you've heard today um, or had any questions uh, for Emily, feel free to reach out to her on LinkedIn. Um, welcome to share this episode with others as well. Uh, leave a review or even subscribe to the podcast. So until next episode, thanks for listening to Now That's Significant. <laughs>